All right. Hopefully everyone's actually here for this topic. If you're not, I'm sorry, but we've oh, closed shit. the doors and you're oh, stuck God. with us. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Thomas Riley. Uh, I do a couple things. I'm a weapons collector. I'm a historical European martial arts practitioner. And as most of you have noticed with the uh, odd-looking bull-like creature that is having a bad case of diarrhea. Um, that's actually called a Bonicon. It is the signature for my channel right now. I have a YouTube channel uh, called Medieval Review. With me, joining me are... My name is Alan Johnson. I'm a screenwriter. I also do fight choreography for theater and film. And I also practice uh, Western martial arts, HEMA, and then play with a little bit of the Bow Hurt guys. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. I'm Joshua Waters. I am with the Palmetto Knights. And I'm a... Uh, HMB fighter. I travel the world in fighting countries, and I also do HEMA. And I'm also a uh, arms and armor collector and an amateur historian as well. Between the two of us, we actually have filled up this wall with a lot of the European weapons here. We're actually going to be talking about them as we go through this uh, presentation, which is why Alan is back there to kind of point at things for us. Um, because a lot of what we're talking about is how swords have changed over time. That is the evolution of swords. Before we jump into it, because we're going to be using a lot of terminology, and I'm not sure how many of you are really super aware of terminology for swords, here's all the different parts of a sword. Uh, most importantly, we're going to be talking mostly about the blades. We'll talk a bit about the design of the grip or the hilt. Uh, the hilt is everything from the cross guard to the pommel. So the cross is that piece right there, also sometimes referred to as the quillen. The grip is, surprisingly, where you grip it's the handle, and the pommel is the end piece, often acting as a bit of a counterweight. The blade itself has an edge, it has a point, those are the things that kill. <laughs> it also has this nice little thing down the center, anybody know what it's called without looking? The floor. Yay! <laughs> no um, we have been successful then in our endeavors to uh, bust some myths there. It's not a blood groove, if anyone ever thought it was. It's not. It's a fuller. It's designed to do two things. Uh, widen the blade while keeping it light, as well as giving it some structure and rigidity. Um, all these aspects of the sword in general will change over time, and it's uh, mostly due to a couple of factors that we'll get to. There is something called a cross-section to swords. This is what it would look like if you kind of made it really fat and looked at it at, uh, kind of point on. Um, there's a lot of different types. The most common ones are lenticular, diamond, and then something like a hexagonal. And then all of those can have some sort of fuller in it. Uh, you also have something called hollow ground. It's very similar to a diamond cross-section. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Generally speaking, though, these are the cross-sections for swords. They're obviously much more flat. This is just a kind of a visual representation. We're going to be talking a bit about what's called typology. And typology is, as defined here, is just a way for us to begin to categorize. We as humans love to categorize things, uh, especially those of us humans who curate museums. They really like to do this. So uh, it's a great tool for researchers to begin to say, well, we can say these swords are this category and this is this category. We do it with pretty much everything. And uh, it's been done with swords. There's a really, really uh, popular one that I seem to have this image covering over for some reason. Um, but we have one called the Oak Shot Typology. Uh, it's a very common one for swords throughout the Middle Ages, uh, anywhere between kind of the late-ish part of the early Middle Ages all the way through to uh, the uh, late Middle Ages itself. We don't speak necessarily with Oak Shot Typology to Viking weapons, and that is because they have their own typology. Um, this is what a typology looks like, though. We'll get to Viking weapons in a moment. This is what a typology looks like. It's organized, it's rigid, it's structured, and it says, this is how you categorize things. But we're not here to talk about typologies per se. We're here to talk about evolution. You know what evolution looks like? Mm -hmm. That. <laughs> More or less. It's organic, it's non-structured, it goes wherever it wants. And for researchers like myself, for people who enjoy swords, who collect them especially, uh, this becomes really problematic. We had this debate while we were setting up this wall, well, where do we put this sword, where do we put this sword? Because they overlap. They, you can't just say this is this time period straight down. They have broad ranges, they overlap. And so we say, okay, well evolution and typology, they're kind of hard to reconcile. And we're going to try to do a bit of that here today, and then we're going to have some fun with the idea of evolution. But the real question is, 
this right here. What caused the sword to evolve? Any guesses? Armor. 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 All right. And, and metallurgy. <laughs> oh, cavalry. A lot of these are all good answers. Um, the big hint right here is oh, what begins to happen at the, at the uh, kind of late stage of the 13th century. It's actually, I think, the earliest I could get it dated was actually around 1248. And that's where we begin to see plate armor come in. And yes, armor was the big driving motivating factor. Uh, arms and armor were in a constant arms race in the Middle Ages. Warfare was all over the place at all times. And these things competed. Happens today, just not in the same way, right? We don't do it with swords and armor now, we do it with different types of gun and ammunition and artillery. Armor changed. It went from mostly male, which uh, is also called chain mail, because when you say male, it can be many different things. Um, and it began to transition into plate. Started off as just male, bits of plate covering specific areas of the body. Uh, started with the head, mostly with big helmets began to move into joint pieces, elbows, shoulders, etc. Uh, definitely the breastplate, and from there it just continued to expand. It began to look like what you see in that suit of armor, kind of. Um, and they got really ridiculous by the time they got to uh, the very, very late stage in the Middle Ages, even early Renaissance, you had some armor that was really ridiculous. Anyone heard, anyone heard of Maximilian armor? Yeah, anyone seen it? These people look like they're human lobsters. There is not anything to be seen. There's very little exposure or any gaps. And that's because the armor kept trying to get away from things getting jabbed into it. But we're going to rewind. We're going to go start at the beginning because, or at least the beginning of the Middle Ages. That's really what we're going to be focusing on here is the Middle Ages. I know the, uh, the track information said this is just kind of evolution of the sword. We would need all con to talk about that. We're going to focus on a very, very small subsection. We're going to be talking about the Middle Ages. Anyone know when the Middle Ages started? Roughly like 500. 500. 500 roughly. Anyone know when it, when it ended? 1500. Okay. It's a really good way of dividing. Like I said, we like to categorize. I, I like to say it began sometime around 500 and it ended sometime, I don't know, because Renaissance was ending in some places while it was beginning in others in a lot of ways. So. Uh, we're going to categorize it 500 to 1500 because that's a good kind of defining point. We're going to talk, talk about Viking swords first, but I'm going to turn it over to the resident expert on this, Josh. All right. In the Viking era, um, swords were predominantly cutting weapons because in the Viking era they did not have plate armor of any form. The only armor that was widely available was male, and the only people who could afford this were professional warriors or the nobility. Your average person, the only protection they had was this. This and the spear they carried in a battle was the only thing they had to protect themselves with. And thus, the professional elite only needed <coughs> large cutting weapons because they did not have to defeat armor. And thus, a, for example, a Viking raider needed only this because he could quickly and easily dismember an armor, unarmored person with this large cutting blade. You did not need a very fine point to find gaps in armor because there was none. Thus, this was able to quickly and effectively dispatch your foe, and it worked very well in conjunction of a shield. And it remained that way until about the late 13th century when male armor and plate was starting to come to fashion and becoming affordable to your common person. Your average soldier until about until about the 13th century your average soldier like a conscript a levy still had no armor until about the mid 13th century when gambesons a form of fabric armor that would protect you from sword cuts um, became prevalent with infantry it was simple as none so swords until about 1250 remained the same shape of blade so deep and you can see in later early medieval swords of the Normans, they start getting more taper when armor became more common for thrusting and stabbing, but generally they remain the same shape. It's very similar in shape comparison to a Viking sword. These are uh, also, generally speaking, in terms of cross section, they're lenticular. They're mostly oval shaped. They almost always have fullers going down their entire length. They very often have what's called a spatulated tip, although I don't really see one that's a spatulated tip there, per se. Yeah, there we go. That, that one's spatulated, a lot, lot less of a, a pointy tip on the end. 
again, signifying this is a cutting weapon. Okay. Now, as he said, you begin to get a little bit further in, and this is where what's called the Peterson typology goes away. Peterson was really concerned really about one thing in his typology, and that was the hilt. Because the blades didn't change all that much. But boy, did the Vikings and the migration era swords of Pete the Smiths who made those, they love to change the hilt design. So there's a whole typology for them, I think it goes all the way through Z, to give you an idea of just how many different variations they have, and those have their subtypes, sometimes eight of a subtype. Um, when Oakshot took over, he started at type 10, uh, not so much because of the Peterson typology, but there's a simplified version of the Peterson typology that gets to 9, so he said, well, I'm going to pick up a 10. And that's when he begins talking about uh, what we would tend to recognize, so we call the medieval sword. Keeping in mind, Viking era is medieval, it's just very early medieval. Here are some examples of them. Um, these are all designs that come from a swordsmith called Peter Johnson, named Peter Johnson. Um, fantastic, world-renowned swordsmith, and he has done a lot of research of museum originals, and these are examples of these different types of typologies. We're going to talk a little bit more about them uh, in a moment. But in general, uh, these are all still cutting. Uh, really heavily focused on that. You can tell this because they mostly have parallel edges. They don't taper. Uh, so you can see on many of these early ones, um, they are still mostly parallel edges. They don't have that taper, which is that coming to a point. As you'll see when you look at later ones, they come to sharp points. Um, and uh, the tips tend to be either spatulated or only very basic points. Again, this is the motion that they're doing. They're not thrusting as much. Um, and again, all of these tend to have that lenticular oval type uh, cross section. The main reason be behind that is, well, when you forge these things, it's really easy to get that general shape and then mash that fuller in there and you've got your blade. It's not that easy, but close enough. <clears throat> Uh, we have what I like to call the red-headed stepchild of all medieval swords. <laughs> this is the Type 14. It is the earliest example we have of the uh, quintessential cut and thrust. It's very short, mind you, and that's actually very common for these. Uh, my favorite of these is Boromir Sword from Lord of the Rings. Um, Peter Lyons was the sword <coughs> who designed it. It's a really good example. Um, and this, while still having the oval cross section, this actually is a replica, has a little bit of a ridge in it. Um, the fuller comes back a bit, that's to help make sure the weight is just where it needs to be in terms of getting a good uh, feel to it, good center of balance. And uh, it's short, so you can get ready for a good thrust. And it's designed still with mostly parallel edges, although you can tell it's beginning to taper for that thrust, but it's still designed to cut. Cut and thrust sword. Um, this is really, I would say, the only true type of cut and thrust sword, although swords from this point on are designed very often with both of those things in mind. They just choose one over the other. So generally speaking, a sword's going to be better at cutting or thrusting. This one's good really at both. Uh, one other thing to note about the Type 14 typology, the earliest known medieval fighting manual, the 133 manuscript, also focuses on the use of the Type 14 sword. It's the earliest medieval fighting manual we have on record. And that manual is Sword and Buckler. It's a beautiful manual, um, and you see them fighting. One of them looks like a monk, and the other one looks kind of like a lady, and we're not really quite sure which is which sometimes. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a beautiful manual, and, uh, and yes. Again, this is such a weird one. This is almost an aberration why I call it the redhead stepchild because it doesn't necessarily follow our concept of the evolution because it's getting to thrusting before thrusting was really a thing. Um, as you can see, it's hitting 1250 to 1350. It's a very actually very short time range. And 1350 is really when all this stuff kicked into high gear and you really begin to see heavy tapers, etc. Uh, we also then begin to get into the, the much uh, more thrusting-oriented weapons. These come to a very, very distinct taper. They also begin to change their cross-section. They go from that lenticular to that diamond cross-section. Uh, the ring deck on the wall there, the, yep. this is, in my opinion, one of the quintessential examples of a thrusting-focused weapon. Um, it can cut. I have cut with this. But you can see how thick the blade is, relatively speaking. 
Um, it's got quite a lot of mass down that center. It actually makes it a little bit more difficult to get through your target, especially when you have a lot of ma uh, mass to displace. This was solved to some extent with what I call the hollow ground cross section. It helped to split a little bit better. The, the, the edge is a little bit more acute there. Um, but it's thrusting focused. It comes to that really, really, really dramatic taper. The reason for that is if you're fighting someone and they, you know, we're fighting and I may be cutting at them or trying to poke at them, I come up, up against an opponent in armor, I can go to what's called half sorting and it's sharp. This is actually very sharp, but you can grab it and you can fight like this. It becomes a short spear and I'm just going to try to get into the armor. That's actually my goal uh, with a thrusting type weapon. Again, most of the troops I might come across in a battle, eh, they're going to be in a gambeson. I'll just take them out however I see fit. Um, but when I have to go to that thrusting, it matters. It's also worth noting at this point, generally speaking, we're going to talk about armor a lot. Um, swords are sidearms. I know we romanticize them. Um, they are the equivalent of a pistol to the modern military's assault rifle. Uh, the assault rifle would be like a pole axe or one of those pole weapons back there. Um, but by this point in the Middle Ages, as Josh mentioned, Viking era, you had to be kind of wealthy. By the time we get to the you know, high to late Middle Ages especially, swords were almost a dime a dozen. They'd been manufactured for a while, you could get used ones, you had hand-me-downs, you had heirloom swords, um, and they were, just, they were so common that everyone had one, and by the late Middle Ages, some people had to have them by law. There were certain cities that said, you have to be armed as a household. Happened a lot in Germany. Um, no surprise, right? <laughs> Uh, but these type of weapons were definitely a lot more common, and their ability to get into armor uh, began to evolve a lot more, because that was the need. As armor progressed and progressed and progressed, the sword became less and less useful to get into the armor, uh, and we went backwards to some extent, going into a more cut and thrust model. So, uh, in terms of examples of this uh, up there, we have a couple of the great swords that have a little bit of taper to them. That sword of Rovin, to, just to the left of the claymore, uh, to the left, yeah. uh, is kind of a good example of this. The, uh, the cross section for these, you notice the time range goes from 14th to 16th century. Um, the reason for this change, again, is because armor got really good and swords quit being all that useful to get into the armor, although they still work, and they say, you know what, we, we kind of want to go back to just cutting, because uh, those, those really pointy ones, they're great and all, but trying to get into the armor is a nice thing to have when I come across at night, but half the people I'm fighting, more than half are these unarmored soldiers, and I'd rather just hack them down. So let's go back more to a cutting style. They still really focused on thrusting, and in order to facilitate that, they go away from that lenticular cross-section. Part of the reason is lenticular is great for cutting, but it also adds a lot of flexibility. So in order to add some rigidity, they would either do ridges with fullers, or sometimes they do a hexagonal cross section. Um, these are all very, very efficient uh, weapons just in general, and that's kind of what you see. Now as I said, this 14th to 16th century, and the thrust weapons are almost in the same time range in a lot of ways, and so these things began to form together. Um, Again, we like to categorize. It doesn't have a strict start-stop. These things just kind of blend into each other over time. And you're very likely, if you were to go back in a time machine, you would probably see the sword I was just holding next to the sword I was holding before that. And who knows, there might even be someone who has their great-great-great-grandfather's Viking arrow sword. One other thing to note is when they would start going back to cutting oriented long swords is because they had better weapons to defeat armor with, such as that war hammer on the top. That became the predominant weapon for destroying and damaging armor, as well as the pole axes. Whereas, for example, I can testify to this just as yesterday, <laughs> you can get hacked with a sword all day long and good plate armor, and it's not ever going to get through to you. Whereas, getting hit with that spike is going to punch holes in there and inflict massive trauma to you. Even if it doesn't penetrate, it's still going to concuss you or bruise you or break bones. And so they no longer needed very pointed swords because just destroy the armor and the person inside it. <laughs> <laughs> to that end as well, Alan, can you grab that uh, with an hour blood? Um, swords actually began to consider that as well. Uh, there are examples of this that we'll talk about in a moment, actually. 
but while we're on the subject, one of the great things about the sword is that it doesn't take much to bring it from being a sword to being a pole axe. Here's how you would do it. You'd be fighting, you go, oh no, here's a guy in armor, I'm going to try to half sword. Oh no, he's in really good armor, I'm going to try to concuss him. I'm just going to knock him away and hit him with the edge of the hilt. This hurts. This hurts a lot. This was actually featured in a Nova, I want to say it was a Nova National Geographic, National Geographic yes. uh, video about Talhofer, Hans Talhofer, who made a really fantastically inventive and maybe slightly just fantasy fight book, um, but he chose this exactly, getting hit, and you see some people who are recreation experts do exactly that, and you watch a guy in full armor get hit by it, and then go to his knees, and then realize that he feels queasy, and it would be no different than if he got hit by a really, really good pole axe. Um, so swords consider those things, and the people who were using them considered them as well. One of the things that made these cut thrust weapons a little bit more difficult to that end is because they began to go back towards having slightly more parallel edges. It's harder to do half sorting. Half sorting works really well on tapered blades because you can get your, your, or your hand around it, and you can do so in a safe manner that won't cut you. And when they get really thick blades like that uh, Scottish uh, great sword, also known as a claymore, as a colloquial, um, you can't really half sword that all that well because it's a really thick blade. It's also worth knowing that's a very late period blade with an oval cross section. Someone went back and reinvented it. Good old Scotland. Uh, they went back to the beginning and they created a really fantastic weapon uh, that's iconic at this point. A big reason for that is, especially in the Scottish Highlands, they were notoriously poor and they were a good 20 to 50, sometimes even 75 years behind the rest of Europe. So at this point in time, in the 1500s, up in the Highlands, people are still hanging on to coats of mail. So this still works against people um, that can bring a lot of pain to somebody in a coat of mail. You probably aren't going to cut anybody with it, but that's a lot of leverage that you can lay into somebody wearing nothing but a, a padded uh, coat and a shirt of mail. Um, so that was very common. So that kind of helped with that resurgence in that particular region because of the economics. And so interestingly, we have a blade here that essentially was from <coughs> Uh, the early Middle Ages to some extent, but was reviving itself in the 16th century. Yeah. All right, so I actually decided to do something that uh, surprisingly no one has ever done before, is I couldn't find it online, so I had to spend hours figuring all this out. I decided to put these sword typologies on a timeline, properly overlapping, and to note where armor advancements happened. I wanted to see if you could make some correlations, because these correlations have been made for a long time, but no one ever just graphically put it up there. So you can see right here, you got a lot of cutting weapons going through uh, from about 800 on. Of course, before 800, you've got a lot of the Viking era swords. This is only speaking to oak shot typologies. By the time you get to transitional armor, which is that first vertical line, uh, that's where you begin to see that change over to thrust and to cut thrust almost simultaneously. And as time progresses into better and better plate armor, look what happens to the cut-centric weapons. They all but disappear. Now this is based on research of uh, you know, sword researchers, of museum curators, of a lot of really, really well-respected well people um, in the community at large. Thankfully, I get to rest on their shoulders. I have nothing to do with this other than making a graphical representation, but the overlap is actually quite striking in my opinion. Um, and I think that's a fascinating insight to see that, yes, the evolution happened because of armor. There were other things uh, for armor specifically that made it change, not just swords, but swords did react to armor. We also have some other one-offs, some strange things uh, that are sword-like. Uh, the falchion, for example. It is a sword, technically. It is a very different type of sword. There's actually a typology for falchions and for something called Messers, which are um, called the Elmsley Typology. This is actually a new typology that was only published the first time, I think only two years ago, uh, in a 2015 book, um, which is really fascinating that I'll be doing a talk on in the next panel. Um, but these are really heavily focused on cutting. They have a single cutting edge. They also have 
a usually sharpened. This one's blunt because it's a cheap replica. Uh, but they have a sharpened back edge as well. There's a whole method for fighting with these things that are really fascinating. Their sister, as it were, is called a Messer. You also may have heard of Gross Messer, which is a double-handed version. They look exactly the same. They function exactly the same. Does anyone know the difference between the two? One length. Where do you stand? Um, where they're made? Oh, man. It Everyone's so close. The hilt. The hilt, in general, yes. So what makes that different, so Messer basically means knife, Gross Messer means large knife in German, um, and the thing that makes the, that different from a Messer is simply how the grip is made and how the hilt is made. Uh, they both have crosses, they both have something equivalent to a pommel. Uh, the only difference is where the tang of the sword, so the blade comes down to a, a, sh a shoulder and then to a tang that goes through, it's either exposed or it isn't. It's almost the entire difference. Anyone know why that matters? Because there were things called guilds back in the day, and they basically operated the same way that unions today work. And some knife makers said, man, there's a lot of people needing to buy swords because the laws say they need to own swords. So I'm going to start making swords. And the Sword Makers Guild came up and said, you can't take our business. You can't make swords. And they said, we're not making swords. We're making large knives. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing. We also get some other odd variations. We don't have an example of this one here, but we have this really large one. It's not to scale. If it was to scale, it would be about yay tall with me. It's called the Zweihander, uh, two-hander. It is a very, very specialized weapon um, used only in battle warfare or uh, battlefield warfare, although there are some manuals that speak to the use of large swords like it in one against many combat. Um, but in general, it was used uh, to fight on the front lines. It could become very much like a spear. Some people say it was used to break pikes, and a lot of people have interpreted that as I hit a pike and it breaks. Um, we were having a conversation about this a couple days ago. Anytime you hear the term break, it doesn't necessarily mean to snap. And sometimes it just means break the defense, break the guard, move it aside. These worked really well for it. Uh, they were probably some of the heaviest swords, weighing in anywhere between 8 to 10 pounds, 10 pounds at the most. Um, and they were sometimes extremely ornate uh, and beautiful weapons. Um, they weren't just localized to Germany, but a lot of them were. Uh, you get some other examples. Scotland, again, surprise, surprise, had some really big swords. You also have these other little more thrusting-centric swords that came out of the Middle Ages called estocks. Uh, this ended up being the great granddaddy of the kind of at the time, the rapier, the modern day rapier, as we would call it, modern being Renaissance. Um, and these were swords that were designed almost exclusively to thrust to get in between mail and to get into joints, uh, to the point that their edges were mostly blunt and they just couldn't cut. Now that we've talked about all the normal stuff, anyone want to look at the weird, what I would call genetic mutations? <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, evolution of sword recap. It's crazy. It's messy. We have typologies. They overlap in weird ways. All right, mutations. You can find a lot of this stuff. I could go on for hours about weird mutations. I'm going to give you some examples. These are all going to technically be swords in as much as they are made in the same way swords are made, but boy, are they going to be strange. Here's a normal one. This is my most normal mutation. You grab them off the wall. This is called a fetter. Anyone know what it's for? Fetter. Training. 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 Also called a fetter shrout, means feather sword. Some people say because it's light. Some people say because it doesn't hit as hard. Um, I don't think either of those are accurate. I think someone was just like, uh, they keep saying the pen is mining the sword, and we need to, well, we use quills, so this is a sword, this is a pen as well. No, um, it's a little bit different, it's very blunted. It's very, very small in terms of blade uh, width. Uh, doesn't taper nearly as much. Has this fancy little thing here called a shilt, means shield. It's a secondary guard. Uh, we're not entirely sure, honestly, if we're gonna be truly honest, we're not entirely sure if this is actually all that useful, useful as a secondary guard, but it is extremely useful for making sure that the balance is correct. Without this, this whole thing doesn't quite feel right. It's meant to be a stand-in for one of those sharp swords over there. And if it can't stand in when you're training with it, then how can you actually learn to do things correctly? It's blunt. Um, this one, modern reproduction for use in historical European martial arts, is made to bend mostly at the tip. 
Um, the purpose on that is when I thrust at one of my friends, I don't hurt them too bad. Uh, and otherwise, it's just a really, really basic training sword. Um, oddly enough, until historical European martial arts came along, there were actually museums that had these in their collection, and they were like, oh, we don't know what these are. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. One of the things the internet has done is it made us begin to recognize it, because we see art like this that shows the fader. Um, this is from uh, uh, Meyer. Uh, and this is an example of faders being used. Uh, and the people who had these fight books weren't the people who had the faders in the other museum, and they weren't talking to each other, and it wasn't until some of these historical European martial arts came along doing a lot of research said, oh, that's a fader in your collection. Pretty neat. What time period? Uh, these are actually technically, for a lot of places, in the Renaissance period. They're the kind of mid to late 16th century. Uh, long swords were still being used at that time. Um, the earliest uh, examples of, of long sword fighting goes into the Middle Ages, but a lot of these are Renaissance manuals. And I say Renaissance, what is Renaissance in Italy is still Middle Ages for uh, you know Germany and, and England, and it, it moves like a wave. Many things move like a wave through Europe. <coughs> one is the plague, the other one is enlightenment. Um, so. And there are pockets that could resist uh, those things in odd ways, and we call them Ireland. <laughs> I'm allowed to make that joke. My last name is Riley. Don't hold it against me. No, Ireland is great. In fact, they were an odd bastion for intelligentsia for a long time. Um, but anyway, here's another odd mutation. Anyway, tell me what's going on with this. Hold it for a half hour. There you go. Exactly. So we actually have a couple of examples here. This is a museum original on the left. On the right is art from uh, Fiore di, di Battaglia. Um, Fiore was an Italian fight master who wrote an amazing treatise on fighting. And he had these weird things in one of his treatises. And everyone looked at it and was like, I'm not sure what that art is. And then some people found these in museums and were like, oh, this all makes sense. It's for half sorting. Now, it's a sword designed specifically to half sword. You can also see just a little bit that there might be some indications this is kind of a quasi fader, but it's sharp. So it could probably be actually used specifically and targetedly for judicial duels. Pretty interesting. So there's a half sorting in action. <coughs> Oddly enough, I couldn't find any examples of that specific sword being used in half sorting, even in, in, uh, in Fiore's work. But that's exactly what I was talking about. We talked about a little bit earlier. How about this? What's going on here? Pommel strikes. Sometimes you. So I talked a little bit about going from half sorting to then going around to what is uh, commonly referred to as the Mord Hal, the death strike. Uh, that's where you hit with that uh, either the pommel or you'll hit with the equivalent or the cross guard. And then you have some examples here of how they are designed to be extremely pointy. This is from Tallhoffer's document. Again, I said he made some weird looking stuff that are quasi fantasy. There were drugs in the medieval era too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, and when what the hazard to guess what uh, this little odd ring here is and what this ring here is? Uh, counterbalance? No. Grip is close. I actually have the same thought. Is this like slipping as much? Stick your thumb in. Hold on. Whack. Hilt of some kind. Cross of some kind, maybe. So what this is, and it's kind of hard to tell, especially on the um, Tallhofer version, which are the two that are flanking the one in the middle. The one in the middle is Fiore again. It's a ring that is designed to slide down to the tip of the blade. What you can't tell in the drawing is that these blades are actually made thicker, closer to the tip, so the blade, so the ring can't go off the tip. It's meant for when you go to half sorting, you have a hand guard. Just slides up, and now you've got your own hand guard. Someone said grip. I guess the same thing with the Talhofer one because it looks a lot more like something you'd stick on the end of it, like a big donut. Um, I actually went and bought a little foam bowl from Hobby Lobby and carved it at, out and saw if that would actually work if you put it on as a grip. And it worked, and you can, and it sticks. I was like, huh. So maybe it's both. I don't know. Do we know what that's made of? 
probably would in the Tallhofer one. Probably. Uh, in the Fiore one, it is metal. We know that. We've actually seen some examples of that. So again, it's kind of go to that half story. So this time, you get your guard. Here you actually have Fiore showing it in use. The art and the dimensions of the art are a little bit confusing. Um, anyone want to take a guess what this is? You're absolutely correct. It is a lot like a spear. The only thing making this any different from the boar spear that sits on the back there is that it's a sword. It's actually a hunting sword. It's designed so someone can have a nice little sword while they're riding on their horse and they see that boar and they go, ah, they stick it with their sword. Um, very odd looking thing. Uh, again, a couple of museum originals out there. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit different, right? You're not going to battle with this. This is someone's idea of taking their swords on their hunting trip, essentially. Can you explain the reason for the lug? Yes, sorry. So um, the, these kind of little secondary guard pieces, you'll actually see something very similar on the Zweihanders. That's actually meant for a secondary guard. In this case, it's meant to stop the blade from penetrating too far into the boar. That's going to go running around, and you don't want to take your pretty sword with you. Uh, <laughs> so it's only going to go in so far, then it's going to stop, and you can pull it back out. No, the rings are actually uh, designed to give extra protection to the hand. <clears throat> really weird to see that because I'm not sure a boar comes at you with their own sword. Um, All the tusks. Uh, tusks. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, the tusks do stick out a lot. That, yeah, no. Um, what what what's interesting about this and what probably happened here, if I had to guess, is they had a sword and the blade broke, and they took the hilt components, and they stuck it on another blade they had for their hunting sword, and there you go. You've got this weird thing that everyone's going to scratch their head at me. I'm not exactly sure what this is, and they will confuse historians for generations. If you really want to confuse future historians, just take things that we understand how it works and make it strange for no reason, and then bury it in the ground. It's the long con. It's really good. Here's another one. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Two for one. Yeah, th this is for that knight who goes, man, the sword is so romantic, I don't want to pick up a pole axe. <laughs> Eureka, idea. There's actually an example of another one. It's are weird, aren't they? <laughs> this is the fun of actually what I get to do when I sit down and research, and when uh, when historical okay. European martial artists begin to dig into these manuals and they hear these things, they read these things, they're like, what are these people thinking? So much bleed at the Right. Uh, you got me, man. I don't know. I don't have and an example of this actually. thing is that but. because they're mutations, and we have very few examples of them, and they only appear a couple times in these manuals, we realize people say, well, let's try this thing. Yeah, that wasn't a great idea. Let's go back to the normal stuff <laughs> that actually but, so it's kind Let of me ask you guys a question. Have you ever done something really silly, and by silly I mean stupid, and yet somehow it still ended up on Facebook or Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> Ye old Instagram. <laughs> This is what happens when you have an idea and you're going to document it and you go, Oof, man, that was bad. this has been a rough con. I don't know what we were thinking. I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that and use it as my brain. All right. Getting back to reality a bit. These things didn't stop at the end of the Middle Ages. They continued on. Uh, to speak a little bit about that, I'm going to hand it over to Alan to talk a little bit about... Uh, what happened past the Middle Ages? What happens around uh, past the Middle Ages as we start to get into the Renaissance and further on, we start to see a big separation between what is relevant and functional on the battlefield and what people carry around for their personal arms and armor. And that is no better personified than what we get in the advent of the rapier. Um, and that's this thing, it's almost predominantly a thrusting weapon, although earlier versions of it uh, do have a wider blade, some with a little bit more blade presence. These also experience their own evolution of um, sort of cutting and thrusting, but eventually they mostly evolve into this type of pattern where it's almost exclusively a thrusting uh, oriented weapon. Uh, 
And these were oftentimes used with an offhand dagger, such as this, where you would deflect an incoming blow and then counter thrust with the rapier or deflect this way and jab them that way. Um, it's a very different style of fighting than using a longsword. A lot of the, the theories behind how you move, finding angles, and things like that is, is fairly universal, but it was a, definitely a unique um, and different evolution of, of weapons. And, you know, this is what you take to the bar when you go drinking with the friends to make sure you get home okay. Um, there's just not enough blade presence to really take these things into battle and do anything with. So this is your, your civilian self-defense. And they go through an evolution. We have a few more um, up on the wall. Some of them will have solid protection over the hands, like little clamshell-like patterns that offer a bit more protection against penetration coming in on your hands. Um, eventually, like especially in Spain, they had a cup. It just looks like a metal bowl that comes over the hands that protects it solid. Um, so that, that's something that they experience there. An also interesting thing is while we, we have that going on, we're still having to have wider blades to be used in military things. So we start to see more sabers come into play. We also see um, the advent of the broadsword, the basket hilt broadsword start in about the start very end of the 1500s and definitely picking up steam through the 16 and 1700s. And you'll see that in the, the basket hilt that has the red lining in there. I forgot to pull it down. Um, but it's, um, it's a very good cutting and thrusting blade. Their next one, the sword over from that is a back sword. It's a single edged sword, also very good for uh, a battlefield use. Um, about the same time that this is really becoming popular, there is a sword master by the name of George Silver who was in England and he just railed against the rapier and the Italian invasion into his country, taking away the, the martial arts of his homeland. And his theory was, if you're gonna spend the time training in a weapon, better make it something that you can use in warfare and for civilian self-defense. So his, or his whole theory was based on I can develop one system using one weapon that I can use for all scenarios. But of course, at this time, we get things that go bang, and that starts to really affect things on the battlefield. And once we start getting more reliable weapons, things that can actually uh, fire reliably and quickly, <coughs> the sword quickly devolves. Um, so by the time we get about to the 1800s, swordsmanship was definitely dying uh, very quickly. Um, the, the quality of the manual start to go down. We start to see a disconnect between uh, the lethality of the techniques of earlier era and be people basically saying, if you got to use a sword, here's a couple of cuts you can use, and I guess if you block, you can turn it this way. If you need something coming from here, I guess you can block it this way. Um, and that's kind of really what we're starting to see around the uh, later period, especially as, far as we get into the, the Civil War and Revolutionary War era with the saber work. Um, it's really devolved from there. Um, one thing I did forget to mention earlier is at the end of the 18th century, a little bit prior to that, we start to see the small sword, um, which is a triangular cross section, very sharp tip, very lethal thruster, does not cut, but this was used a lot for personal duels and it's very small, you know, uh, small movements, you don't cut with this thing. And this was also a piece of male jewelry. It was a flashy thing that people like to look fancy with. But it was commonly used for civilian duels around that time period. And several people had some very good uh, manuals based on that. Early 1700s, a guy named Sir William Hope had a very effective martial art built around this thing. And then it starts to turn into the school fencing, the school fencing. And it, this is kind of what evolves into modern Olympic sport fencing. Um, the foil and epee type of stuff like that, but um, but yeah, small sword, and then things quickly start to go downhill as far as swords can, is concerned. Anything to add to that? I, I was with you until you suggested that the English were somehow agoraphobic. And Come I, on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I will say yeah. that one of my favorite aspects of this of the uh, small sword specifically, talking about it being bling. Uh, the way these were actually manufactured is there'd be some really good swordsmith to make a blade and he'd send it off to the local silversmith who was really busy making tea sets and they would go mold out these really pretty hilts and they'd assemble it all and they'd go sell it to the person who was a poor schmuck who would spend a lot of money on it. Uh, yeah, silver hilts and gold hilts and it was all to walk around and be like, look at my sword, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm compensating. Yeah. <laughs> Alright everyone, any questions?
You said that swords reacted to the armor. Did the armor progression have anything to do with the invention of the English longbow or the crossbow or anything like that? Uh, in general, yes, armor did react in a lot of ways to uh, advancements in archery. The big one was actually the crossbow. Mm -hmm. um, arrows had a halfway decent penetration of male, especially English longbows, is why they were very effective. Very large poundage draw on those bows. Uh, crossbows made that poundage draw possible for everyone, um, and they would get right into mail pretty easily. Um, some notes too about longbows is the quality of the armor affected a lot, because there are examples of 200 pound draw weight English longbows failing to penetrate well-made breastplates. And then there are cases of why the crossbow is so effective. There's a popular type of crossbow in, from Genoa in Italy called an arborist. And they sometimes went up to 1,200 pound draw weights. They were impossible to pull back except those special ratchets that would crank it back. Yeah, I'm more likely to want to go up against the gun at that point. <laughs> um, but, the, but yes, it did react to, to archery and advancements in archery. Like I said, the swords reacted to armor. Armor only kind of reacted to the swords. It reacted to everything on the battlefield, including guns. Guns were coming into uh, prominence in the 13th century in really, really crude formats. And over the next couple hundred years, they got really effective. And the <coughs> armor got thicker over time because of that. But it got to a point where the armor got too thick, and then it was too heavy, and people didn't want to wear it. And that's where you begin to see it drop back down. If I were to go uh, way back in this presentation, and it might be hard for some people to see, but as you can see, as we move well into the 17th century, the armor comes down to just really kind of the core breastplate again. Um, so it got really big and really bulky and covering everything, and then it retracted back. Uh, and the reason for that was because uh, guns were getting too good, and they really had a breastplate to defend against the melee combat that would still be going on. But they didn't bother covering the rest of it at that point. They were done. Uh, and guns were, were definitely the primary thing. Sir. Um, you talked a little bit about the Scottish, uh, the Claymore, and the basket hilts. Uh, how much do you, how much did geography and, and culture, culture affect the evolution of the swords? So you saw that you cut the, the, the cut and thrust versus the thrust. Were those geographically driven? Were those? In some cases, you get some geographic starting points. But in a lot of the Middle Ages, trade was rampant, and once you killed someone on the battlefield, you'd take their weapon, and then their weapon would make their way back to the homeland, and the spits of the homeland would go, oh, it didn't take very long for this stuff to spread. On, on a historic time scale, it spread like wildfire when something got happened, but yes, the inventiveness would happen, but geographically, I'm not aware of any geographic reasons for any changes. Specifically in Scotland, and I, that's one of my passion areas as well, so I, I've done a bit of time uh, looking at that. We know for a fact that they imported a lot of blades from basically Germany, um, from the Solingen, Prussia area. They imported a lot of their blades and then fitted things locally. Um, they had a, a job that was called a sword slipper. Um, and these, these were one of the guilds. And they, their job was to take these imported blades that were brought in and then create all the hilt furniture and put it all together. Um, so they imported a lot of their blades from overseas uh, because of the quality of the steel that was coming out of that area at the time. Um, but again, because of their demographics and their economy, they were a good you know, 20, 30, 40 years behind the rest of Europe as far as what they were doing in their daily and monthly conflicts. So. Uh, and, and generally speaking, you know, there would be a lot of trade again and importing of blades. You think, well, aren't these countries going to be at war? Really, everyone was at war with England, and England was at war with everyone else, and they're all <laughs> trading around England. Um, come think of, there is one geographic thing I would say. There are differences in long swords based on region. We know this from Italian versus German. German long swords tend to be longer, Italian long swords tend to be smaller. One reason is swords tend to be proportional to your body size. Italians being Mediterranean, their diets, as well as just Genetics, they are slightly shorter people. When you're fighting a big German guy, I'm going to do my impression of an Italian here. <laughs> <laughs> they have slightly shorter blades. They, they fight in a manner that actually supports that. Uh, they are very thrust-centric. If you ever watch, in, he, in the HEMA world, we make fun of Italians all the time, but honestly, it's because we're afraid of them. We, they are just terrifying.
Uh, they run up and they stab you a lot and it hurts. Um, but, uh, but there are some regional variations because of things like that, but generally speaking, not really. Uh, I saw one question, hand raised over here, I guess. I think, ma'am, it was you. I just had a question about at uh, what point did the, I guess, smelting or, you know, the ability to extract pure metals or, you know, blend them together, whatever it was they were doing with the materials, at what point did that come pretty standardized? Right about there. The Viking era was really good at making, we were already really good at making steel at that right. point. So what, what was so different about the, was it Ulfbert? The, uh, I, I would need an entire panel next Dragon Con to talk about this. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Ulfert is the Gucci of swords. It is uh, almost a trademark to some extent. They were just well known for being really good swords, and they were so well known that then you have people making knockoffs and calling them Ulfert's as well. Um, it was a, it was at least traditionally and to some extent from a legend perspective. We assume it was a really, really good smith who was making really, really good swords, and everyone wanted one, and he would put his name in it. It's about as far as we can go with any kind of real good solid historical guess, but in general, they were just really good swords, made really well. Um, but steel was being made really well in the Viking era, and I'm going to go ahead and dispel a myth here. Medieval swords are not blunt. They are sharp. They are really, really solidly designed. You can take any sword off this wall and bend it, and it will come back to shape. Um, they are incredibly rigid, re resilient weapons. Um, they can take a beating. They can give a beating. Um, there, there's really nothing functionally that is any different uh, in terms of steel making or anything like that that comes from anywhere else in the world. They are on par, at the very least, in many of these regards. And I know that pop media tends to say, you know, here's this guy finding this really big, heavy sword, and here comes the person with the katana, and they're like, psh, 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 and then the tank falls apart, and where'd the tank come from? <laughs> <laughs> but none of that is actually really true. They're all swords, they're all beautiful, they all work really well as instruments of death, um, but they're all really solidly constructed in their own right. Uh, I saw a question back there, sir. I noticed that uh, when you started getting to thrust swords, the hill strip started to get longer. Is that so you can get a second hand on there to give you more thrust? Um, partially, uh, the really you actually see two-handed swords pretty early on. Um, it's just the hilts get longer to facilitate the use of it with two hands. Go ahead. Oh, another reason they start going to two-hand swords is when plate armor came into strong use. You no longer needed a shield. Yeah, drop that shield. You can use it in two hands and get more technique, longer range, a larger and longer weapon, and have more control over the blade because you no longer need a shield because they have plate armor on. Well, maybe even kind of overcoming your own deficiency in strength just removing your armor too to have more to your blade maybe? Well, properly made European armor was not that heavy at all. We probably have time for like two more questions, sir. Uh, what exactly was it that caused the rapier to go from sort of more of a thicker, almost long sword blade to the more modern Renaissance rapier? I'd say probably, if I had to really hazard a guess, I would say it's the move away from being a military to a more civilian style weapon. The thrusts were just more lethal in general? Thrusts were easier to do in the fighting style that was being used in the region that's being used, right? Uh, you go on a Venetian street. Did anyone ever been to Venice? Yeah, Venetian streets. Yeah. People like me don't fit in Venetian streets, right? There's a reason that it's a thrusting weapon, not a cutting weapon. Yeah, you can't. Um, but but generally speaking, uh, the thrusting is very lethal. But uh, and we talked. There's a little bit about this in a previous talk today. Talked about some of the the dueling practices. Um, they just moved away from being weapons of war and being weapons of duels a lot of times, and also things that people held in their hips to say, look how pretty my sword is. And so I think that they got lighter because you have civilians who don't train with them every day. They just have them on their hip. Uh, they, they want to have that mobility over you know, the cutting potential. It prob there's probably a lot of reasons for it. I'm sure that somewhere someone wants to do a doctoral thesis and they can choose that one specific topic to try to dig into because it really would take that. I mean, it takes that amount of resource to ever figure out with any high degree of confidence how these things work. But along those same lines, it's like we discussed before with the evolution going all over the place. At that same time that that was happening, there were other people, and like I was talking about with George Silver, that says, that's a stupid idea, don't do that. In fact, I'm going to make my blades a little wider like they had it in the medieval period. 
And so you get the basket hilts and the, 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 the basket hilt claymore and stuff like that, which <coughs> was more of a throwback to the medieval style of fighting. The, the, the designs of these things on the global history scale is very fluid in a lot of ways. One more question I think we have time for, or none. Sir? Um, those of you all who are competing in, in the modern, I guess, historical, and historical European martial arts, are you all pretty much going straight to the old treatises when you're looking for a manual to start studying? It? Yes, um, yeah, yes, two aspects. aspects. Yeah, two aspects. <laughs> Let's well, cover. One thing is the HMB fighting, the Bohurts, it's not actually off the battlefield side of it. That's actually, the Bohurts are a form of tournament from the late Middle Ages. And our weapons are more blunt, and it's more of a sport now. It's So we refine our fighting techniques for the sport. Whereas the HEMA people, they're going for the mis medieval techniques for defense and killing, whereas the HMB side of things is more of a s modern sport, a mo hardcore sport, and we don't we don't need the lethal techniques and weapons because we're not actually trying to kill our <laughs> person. We're the fighting. way you kill somebody in armor is to start thrusting into the gap. So in the HMB sport, the one trick thing that you cannot ever do is thrust. So historically, the one thing that you would do to beat somebody armor is the one thing you cannot do in that sport because it works so well. And in the historical European martial arts, as an instructor of this stuff, I, I say this all the time, we really have to focus on the martial art aspect. We are trying to kill people with this martial art. Now, we do it in safe ways, so we don't really kill them. Um, but we, 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 we try to keep that as a mindset, and what that does for us is it makes us make sure that we train on a consistent manner. Uh, and... Um, Martial arts are really easily defined as a system of fighting. Uh, as long as it's kind of a structured system, it's a martial art, as long as it can kill someone, right? That's the purpose of it. And these manuals are comprehensive enough in general, and certainly when you combine different sources from the same authors, you can build a nice fighting system. You have people who do a very specific German longsword from a very specific master, and they can go out there and fight against someone who does an Italian longsword against uh, with an Italian master's uh, system. And there are a lot of commonalities, and there's a lot of differences, um, but they're both martially valid, and we actually test these things out in tournaments, etc. cetera. Um, but in, in terms of practicing it, we, we practice it like we're actually trying to fight. It's no different if you were to just go join a karate class. It's no different. You go learn how to fight. Or you learn how to get a white belt, it depends. <laughs> yeah, we, we got five minutes? Within. Within. I mean, any more questions? Who All won right. Arya or Brienne? Um, I don't know. Everybody I didn't lost. watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't watch it, so don't I spoil actually, it. I had a, um, I, uh, I, do a, I did a stage combat workshop class last night, and we talked about that very thing. The, one, the big problem with that is that Arya is using her sword in a manner which is not consistent with how it should be used. Okay. So her sword, needle, it's a needle. It has a sharp point. It has no edge. It, the blade itself is a shortened version of this. It is exactly like the prop, prop makers literally took a sport FA blade, shortened it, and it has no edge at all. It's just a point. She doesn't have a knuckle bow, she doesn't have the fingering, she has the one loop that's hollow in the middle, and this path is missing. And so she's fighting against Brienne and hacking and slashing. I'll ignore all the matrixy stuff and the twirling behind the back <laughs> and kneeling down in front of her and swatting at the leg. And yeah, I'll, I'll ignore all that because it's fantasy. But the actual sword, she's striking and hacking with this thing. There's no way that I'm displacing his sword with this thing. There's just not enough mass there. Okay, and then she swats at her hand and swats at her like she's wearing plate. She's wearing Tink. full armor. There's no way she's gonna even feel that thing. If she was actually trying to fight and use this thing in a proper manner, then it would be out here. As you would uh, thrust or cut at me, I'd disengage and come over the top. You know, if, or if I tried to bait it and try to swat my sword out, I'd come under and you know play with it that way. Needles don't cut. You don't cut anything with a needle. It's thrusting. But she's up there hacking and slashing, and they made Bran look like an ox on ice skates because she's yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll close with this. One of my all-time favorite little internet gifs is a, a sport fencer going, "Aha!" like this, yeah. And then out of the frame comes a person in like full armor with a claymore going. <laughs> um, 
Sport fencing and things that come from it are a sport. Sport fencers don't necessarily have martial arts on their side because they're using a very light blade. It's electronic tag. It's a beautiful sport. It takes a lot of skill, but it is a form of tag. And it's a sport. And we try to be really clear the difference between a sport and a martial art. All right. Uh, I'll be hanging around for a bit of questions. I think the arm is going to be open for about 30 minutes for the next panel. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it.